abundant in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. we gather for worship this morning, we invite your prayers for the Hefner family. Wyleth has passed away this week, and we'll be preparing to do graveside services on Thursday with the family, and just invite your prayers for the girls as they gather and um, pray tribute to their grandmother. And It's one of those hard times. We don't get the chance to be church family as we would like to in support of the family, but we know that your prayers are with them. We also uh, lift up and give thanks. The second round of vaccines will be taking place for many of our folks on Friday, and we are grateful that we will begin to uh, hopefully see the uh, effects of that as they ripple through our community and through our country as a whole as that process takes place. As we get ready to go to prayer, I just want to take a moment in something in our traditional service that we haven't done a lot and I know doesn't work great when we're broadcasting, but we're just going to take a moment for you to have some silent prayer before I then do a pastoral prayer and then we do the Lord's Prayer. So let us go to our God in this time of prayer. Lord, as we come before you this morning, we come because there's just this irresistible pull that brings us into your presence. Someone somewhere along the way pointed us towards you because of their love and the love that they shared with us about you. It's been a part of our life. You've changed us. You've made us a different person. Lord, we pray that we would continue to have faith that that irresistible power and presence is still active and alive in our lives and in our world. Lord, we give you thanks that we can gather and worship and we can hear again your still small voice. And we pray for your spirit to be in this service today. As we gather to worship, to share love and life, and to remember again, and to feel your presence and the pull of that irresistible love. 
Lord, as we go from this place to the power of your Holy Spirit, enable us to be a people who share that love in ways that continue to invite others into your presence, that point others towards that love, that help people see beyond all of the noise and the chatter that is out there, that amazing grace. Lord, we pray this as we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture this morning is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. This is the word of God, for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Ruthann. Well, in case you hadn't heard, there is this little football game this afternoon, and uh, a whole lot of folks uh, are wearing Chiefs gear in red around here, which is uh, unusual. We think red, we think Cardinals, and uh, um, of course, a lot of folks are fired up about that as well. It's amazing how it can go from... Uh, being their bums, they're not doing anything to signing Arenado, and hey, we're World Series bound. We are bandwagon people captured by the moment. We love to click on, to follow, to get in on the latest trend, the hottest thing. What 
What is it that gets you to follow something? What is it that gets you to click in? What is it that gets you to like something or someone or some event or some happening? And then on the other side of that, man, we are prisoners of the moment. And the second the moment passes, we're just really quick and good about clicking out, about unfollowing, about not being involved in stuff or, or, or defriending or when something doesn't go our way, or when the winds shift, or when the next hottest new thing comes along. It's amazing how we're really fast to move in a new direction. We're really quick to, to dump the old for the new. It's amazing how fast that kind of thing can happen in our world today. We see it. One of the pieces of scripture that I just love is that it talks about how irresistible Jesus was. Now, there were a whole lot of folks who clicked in who were part of the crowd, but in Jesus' day, it wasn't easy like it is today. You couldn't just go on social media and click follow. You couldn't just sort of say, hey, this is something I like, or you couldn't just get an allegiance at, at a distance. In Jesus' day, you had to be a part of the crowd. When you followed, you literally physically had to follow. And so we get these stories in Scripture about Jesus drawing crowds. And these are people who had to physically get up and move and go. No, there wasn't any COVID in those days. Probably was. They just didn't know it. <clears throat> but in the Gospel of Mark, even as early as chapter 2, we get Jesus going to the home base for him and for Peter and Capernaum. North end of the Galilean Sea, a beautiful place. Capernaum was one of those you can go today and take some of those tours and be a part. And they've excavated the synagogue that they think was probably uh, there in Jesus' day and probably the home base for a lot of the stories we have in Scripture. And there's a house that they think may have been Peter's house, may very well have been the house in the story we're talking about. And Jesus has been starting to preach and teach in the countryside and heal some folks, and word has gotten out about who Jesus is. And there's this irresistible power drawing people to Jesus. And so 34 different times in Scripture, it talks about Jesus having these massive crowds far more than it talks about prayer or some of the other things that we like to think Jesus was all about. And the gospel writers tell us that the crowds were so large that as Jesus comes to this house, and this is very early in his ministry, that there are people blocking the door, blocking the, boy, wouldn't fire marshals have a heyday with that? And they're in the windows and the crowd stretch for all kinds of, it says they're literally pushing in on him. And because the crowds are so intense, there are these guys who have a friend who they think can be healed if they could just get him to see Jesus. But the crowds are so massive, they can't figure out a way to get a guy on a stretcher through the crowds and to get him to Jesus. So these friends devise a plan where they push through the crowds enough that they can get up onto the roof and you know how do you get a stretcher up on the roof of a house with somebody who can't help you safely but they manage to do it and they not only get him up there but they then literally tear through the roof creating a skylight if you can imagine Jesus and the other people in the room going whoa where'd that come from But there was such irresistible power in Jesus that these people thought if we could just get our friend in his presence, it would make all the difference. Have you ever experienced that kind of power in your life? There's a woman, a couple of chapters later, chapter 5. Jesus has come into a community and there's a Roman centurion who says, my daughter is ill and maybe even dying, but Jesus, I know. And so here is somebody who is a Roman 
who shouldn't be drawn to Jesus, but there's something about Jesus, his irresistible power that draws him and says, if you would just come, please, Jesus. And as Jesus goes with him, there's this crowd that begins to follow and this massive crowd that's around. And it's so large and so big that this woman who desperately needs to touch Jesus, to see Jesus, to be in his presence, can't get through the crowd. And yet she finds a way to slither through the crowd just just enough to touch the hem of his garment. Have you ever felt the need to be in the kind of crowd, to be drawn to something so much that you would do whatever it took just to touch the hem of a garment? See, Jesus drew those kinds of crowds. There was this kind of irresistible power and quality about what he was doing, and it just kept growing and multiplying, and it says it got so much that people were scared and frightened, and people who were in power, the people who were threatened by these crowds, wanted to stop it, wanted to put it out, so they tried something. It's called crucifixion. And they thought it was the end of the story. It was something they did in order to silence it, to put out the power, to drain it totally. And folks, it seemed like it worked. Even Jesus' closest friends clicked out unfollowed. Everyone disappeared. It seemed like the power went out. Have you ever been in a place like that? Where the bandwagon you were on dried up and disappeared? Where the people you thought you were friends disappeared? Maybe it's a relationship that you were in. Maybe it's a job that ended. Maybe it was something else that happened in your life, but it just seemed like it disappeared. It was over. It was no longer a thing. It's not the trend. It's not the fad. Folks, I've been in active pastoral ministry appointed to serve a church for 40 years. The whole time I've been in ministry, I've gone to workshops, I've read stuff, people have sent me things, given me things, have talked about how the the church is over and its day has passed, our influence is gone. You know, it just, man, if I gave in to all of that, I'd be totally depressed. And I know that COVID has made it even harder to be the church. And for a lot of us last March when things shut down, it just seemed like it was over, that things had disappeared. Maybe a little like Good Friday. But folks, here's what I read in Scripture. Three days later, Three days after crucifixion, after everybody thought it was over, thought it was done, and everybody had unfollowed, all of a sudden Jesus comes out of the grave, and and there is something about Jesus as the risen Lord, as the resurrected Christ, that is more powerful than the person who walked earthly on this earth. And that power is not just in Jesus, but now all of a sudden through the Holy Spirit, that power is in his followers. And it tells us in the book of Acts that these frightened, scared disciples who had unclicked, who had unfollowed, all of a sudden opt in, and now they have the power that Jesus had. And all of a sudden, something that had been just in this little bitty community now becomes this worldwide phenomenon. 2,000 years later, we're still worshiping and talking about it. And some of you know what it's like because you've experienced that power in your life. And you've moved from being dead to being resurrected and something has changed you, touched you, moved you enough that you got up on a really, really cold Sunday morning and got here today. Not normal behavior, folks. There's something about that. Paul describes it in his letter to the church at Corinth. I was one of those people 
who was for crucify him. I was one of those people who checked out and said that we should unfollow, that we shouldn't be a part of this. And all of a sudden, I experienced Jesus' love and the power that he had. And now I'm all in and I am a new creation and something is different about me because I met Jesus and I experienced his love. Now, Paul never met him physically, but he experienced his love and it transformed his life. Have you ever had your life transformed? Have you ever experienced sharing that love with someone else? You know, it's amazing, even in times like this, we keep loving people, and we keep hearing stories of people's lives being changed. One of the stories that they share as a part of some sermons that they did for churches that are struggling and trying to keep things going, and so the conference was doing it. They interviewed a young man from one of our churches in the Kansas City area, so appropriate today. A young man's named Corey. And Corey was one of those persons who got drawn and influenced in a young age by the wrong kind of people. And he ended up in juvenile detention and later in real adult prison, spent 22 years in prison in California, spent the last 18 months of his prison sentence in Missouri because of the overcrowding and stuff in the California prisons. And so then was released and paroled into Kansas City where he knew no one absolutely alone. As Corey tells it, it was one of those to where alone, scared, frightened, not knowing what to do because in prison, one of the things he did was he identified with a group in order to have a group for protection and all of that other. So he became a skinhead. Shaved his head, did tattoos, those kinds of things. But when you're out of prison and out on the streets, that's one of those things where people back off and they don't want to be around you. So the thing that gained him acceptance in prison pushed people away outside of prison. The halfway house he was sent to is one of those ministries, you don't know it, but you support through your apportionment dollars and is staffed by some of our churches in the Kansas City area. And he said he'd always made fun of Christian folks. In fact, that's what they did as skinheads. They beat up on them in prison because they were going to chapel and Bible study and made fun of them, even though, of course, the Arians claimed to be Christian. He said the interesting thing was the people who weren't scared of him and the people who helped him find ways to eat find ways to get a job with these Christian people who he'd always made fun of. He'd never grown up around church or anything like that. That just wasn't part of the community he grew up in. He said, I began to notice there was something different about these people. So I began to ask him, why do you do this? Why do you be nice to somebody like me? And they began to share with it. They were doing it because of Jesus and what Jesus had done for them. And they're just wanting to share it with other people. He goes, I want to meet this Jesus dude. Can I come to church with you? And he said, I was scared to death what people were going to think, but they welcomed me. I not only went to church, but then started going to Bible study. And as I was doing those, he said, then I wanted to talk to the pastor big church, hard to get to the pastor, and then all of the stuff with COVID and other things like that. It became really, really difficult to do in-person kind of things, but he said, I stayed after. The pastor tells his side of the story. He said, you know, it was really tough. Here's this guy wanting to meet with me, but he's always having to check in. He's always having to go to work and do the things that somebody was on parole, trying to find a way that we could meet and work, do all this. But he said, I started talking with the people who were working the ministry at the halfway house. You know, what is it about Corey? What's going on? Can you, can you give me a clue? He said one of the persons there shared with him that, you know, Corey didn't say anything, but while he was in prison, they diagnosed him with leukemia. And along with all the stuff he's having to do for parole and job and that, he's also undergoing treatments. Maybe he needs to talk to you about that. 
He said, I got my pastoral care hat on and I was all ready for this big, heavy conversation about life and death and leukemia and all of that kind of stuff. And, and when Corey came and we, we got a chance to talk at a coffee shop and we're getting ready to talk and, and I'm all set and ready to have this other conversation, Corey goes, Pastor, I need your help. He says, I've got something I, I really need you to help with. He says, I want to be baptized. And he said, it tells us in this scripture from Paul, the scripture we just read. He said that, that we're all new on the inside. He said, the problem is, but my outside still looks the same. And he said, I know baptism is this inward, invisible, and it's this outward, invisible sign of an inward thing that's gone on. And he said, the problem is when people see me, they're scared. And it no longer reflects who I am. I'm no longer this person. I'm this new creation, but but I still look like this. He said, Pastor, can you help me? Because these swastikas on my hand, when people shake my hand or when people greet me, that's not who I am. Can you help me? Pastor said, really cool part about being a downtown church. He said, there's a tattoo parlor right across the street from the church. And he said, we walked him in. And the tattoo person was really, really cool. And so was Corey. He said, Corey told him to take a swastika and turn it in to vines and to connect them into a trunk in his arm that now says Jesus. And it's got the scripture from John about the vine and the branches. And he said, your church has been those branches that have now grafted me into the body of Christ. And I want people to see that testimony when they shake my hand. Folks, even in the middle of a pandemic, people are being loved into the kingdom. People are being drawn irresistibly to Jesus. I don't care about church and all of the other stuff that's going on. There's still something irresistible about the love of God that people see in Jesus. And when people become new creations in Jesus, they change. And everyone around them begins to see the change. So I ask you this morning, are we the kind of people who are going to tear some roofs off in order to get people close to Jesus so they can be drawn to that power just like those folks in Kansas City are doing it in their community? What are we called to do here in Poplar Bluff? order to show that irresistible power and love of Jesus so that others will experience becoming new creations just like Corey. And folks, I can guarantee you there is an irresistible power about him and he is going to touch and bring other people to Jesus that would never have set foot in a church. get drawn. They get drawn when people's lives are changed, when we share that love, when we do the things that others have done to show that love to us. Let's pray. Lord, we see the stories but we know they're not just words on pages. Lord, we know that you have touched us and you have changed us. And we give thanks for your irresistible love in our life. Lord, we pray today, as we gather here and prepare to go, that through the power of your Holy Spirit, we would share that love with others that we would be willing to tear off roofs, to reach through crowds, to do whatever it takes to bring people into your presence. For this we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Our hymn of invitation this morning is number 364. Because he lives, please stand. God sent his 
certain days because he lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I Folks, as passionate about it as we might be a few years from now, Holmes and and Brady will be trivia questions about facing each other in the Super Bowl. Jesus is the one who brings us life, brings us life eternal, and a whole different way of living that can make a difference in your life, my life, and the life of our world. Let us go in the grace and love of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, let us claim that life in eternity and be able to share that irresistible love and power with others. In Jesus' name, amen.